Well, hello and welcome to the uh, Bankers Leadership Series on the Global Transaction Services Business in, in association with the Royal Bank of Scotland. My name is Brian Captain. I'm editor of the Banker Magazine. I'll be your chairperson for this afternoon. And uh, this is the first of four sessions that we're going to do looking at uh, the Global Transaction Services Business. And we've entitled this one, The New GTS Landscape. And we've deliberately made it uh, very broad to kind of paint a sort of broad canvas about the, uh, the business and the challenges it faces. And I think as we move through the series, we'll be probably focusing more specifically on certain topics. And we'll also probably be doing uh, sessions in Hong Kong and probably in, in Europe so we get a more global picture. So now I would like you all to introduce yourselves. Santil Kumar, Group Vice President, Business Development from Oracle. Didier Van Den Director within the Treasury team of PwC based in Brussels and looking after the European network for banking and cash management restructuring. Brian Stevenson, Chairman of Global Transaction Services at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Karen Fawcett, Group Head of Transaction Banking for Standard Chartered Bank. I'm Mark Terry and the Managed Director of Vocalink Transaction Services Division. OK, well, let's start with our first part of the agenda, which is where are we now? And Brian, perhaps I could get you to give your initial thoughts on the kinds of challenges that, uh, that clients are, are facing um, and what are the most concerned about at the moment. Brian, thank you. Yes. Um, I think I would probably classify uh, where we are now into two broad categories, one around customers and one around compliance. Uh, the customer agenda is very much at the fore in the sense of we have to learn the lessons from the post-crisis view that their customers have of the transaction banking business. Um, uh, worries about counterparty risk um, are eminent in people's minds post the, the crisis. Uh, concerns about efficiency and connectivity, but also I think economic factors uh, bear on this as well. We've seen a period, particularly in the developed markets, of prolonged low interest rates. I think lower interest rates than most of our clients thought would persist, lower than we thought would persist, and probably lower the most of the forecasters said would persist in sterling and in euros and in dollars. And that poses particular challenges for transaction banks to deal with the second part of the issue, which is compliance. Um, and compliance is the new regulatory regimes. It's the new um, environment in which we operate post-crisis, which requires us to make considerable investments. Historically, transaction banks have made considerable investments at a point when interest rates are high, i.e. when their profitability is at its peak. Um, at now, we are being asked to make investments when air profitability is cyclically low because of low interest rates. So that sort of sets, I think, the broad challenges that we confront at the moment. OK. Um, well, obviously, the interest rate environment being very low is, is, is very much a sort of developed market uh, aspect. So it would be interesting to get Karen's views, have, having flown in from Singapore to be with us today especially. Uh, how different do things look from Asia? Well, it feels as though we may be in the lull before the storm. Um, we are actually, I think we're seeing in Asia, particularly with local currencies, interest rates are starting to come up. And there's occasional movement in some of the major currencies as well. So we may be at the bottom of where the interest rate cycle is, but we do seem to be bobbing along the bottom. I think the, the, what we've got to look for now is what happens on the regulatory front, as Brian said, with the compliance angles, but also what is going to happen on the capital and the liquidity regulations, which could add inherent costs into the business that haven't been there to the same extent before. But in terms of what we see out in Asia as new things happening, well, there's an enormous amount of shift of business activity and GDP activity towards the east, away from the west, so that's changing things. We're seeing a large new number of entrants into the market, so the clients are getting more choices. Um, and I think new technologies. I mean, Asia is a very early adopter of new technologies, and that is changing the space as well. So. Lots of change. All right, Abe, you did say the lull before the storm there. Didier, what do you feel that uh, are the very broad concerns at the moment in terms of uh, both GTS, market players, and their, and their clients? Yeah. <coughs> so just maybe to explain uh, my role within PwC, um, we look after the corporate. So in fact, I'm going to represent today a little bit the, the voice of the corporate. Yeah, that's um, good. And what we have seen, in fact, is that what you said about counterparty risk is definitely there which was not the case a couple of years ago. I remember talking to the corporates and you were discussing about counterparty risk. Definitely said we are too small. Um, if we work with the big banks, they have a risk on us. It's not really the contrary. That has changed in their mind. Yeah. So liquidity is an issue, access to liquidity, control over liquidity. What does that mean? That does, does that mean fierce competition 
and pressure on price. And the corporates know that. So when they go towards the bank, they yeah. know that they can expect a sharp decrease in pricing, which obviously is going to affect the margins of the banks. So I think for me, that's one of the main challenge is to remain competitive, to remain profitable with a, I would say a topic, which is GTS, uh, seen more and more as a commodity by the corporates. So it's kind of how can I differentiate? How can I still make a margin um, on something where there is fierce competition? Okay, all right, we'll definitely come back to that issue I in a few seconds. Uh, but perhaps I could bring uh, Mark in and uh, do you share that idea that uh, counterparty risk has suddenly come way up to the top in, in corporate concerns? Uh, and then perhaps you could tell us your other kind of ideas on, on what the, th the, the chief thinking is of the market at the moment. I think we're a little bit different to the other guys that have spoken because we provide an infrastructure to allow uh, payments to work effectively within the UK. And so from our point of view, I would take uh, some of the comments and, and say that our focus really as a provider of solutions would be to address some of the issues of cost, to address some of the issues of liquidity, and furthermore, to address some of the issues of service levels and quality. Okay, all right. Uh, Sento, you're also coming from the technology side, so... Yeah, but okay. the difference here is we represent both corporates and the banks, and yeah. we work on both sides of the enterprise. Um, there are two evolving aspects, like Karen said, Asia is uh, bubbling with the 25 to 250 million type of corporations. So the return on uh, from the, those businesses are much different from the traditional lending or lending heavy banking mm -hmm. market that's mm -hmm. been driven in the other part of the world. So the, the requirements of these uh, companies which are like growing from 25 to 250 million are entirely different. They are also automating very fast yeah. and they, have, they don't have a legacy infrastructure to stitch it up and represent the whole world uh, to the bank. They have a very straightforward system to do it. So connectivity that uh, Brian raised is a much far more easier uh, play in, the, in this market. But from a banking perspective, I think compliance takes the, the highest priority now. And we see uh, banks really going after the investment, but it's uh, really capital that they're putting into technology right now. Well, we'll come back to all these issues compliance and and uh, and also how the banks respond to the challenge of, of, of thin margins uh, but Brian I wanted to refer to uh, this uh, document that actually came from Royal Bank of Scotland perspectives on operating risk where you did the survey here of uh, finance executives and the kinds of risks that, uh, and worries that they came up with so under the, the area of economic regulatory and market risks they listed currency fluctuation as their number one concern and then under political safety and security risks, they listed cyber attacks uh, and information security breach. And then in business and strategic risks, risks they listed 37% uh, said loss of customers uh, was their big concern. So I was wondering if you could talk about uh, a little bit about the survey and, and how, you know, I mean, why you think people came up with those kinds of issues. Obviously, loss of customers is kind of obvious when we read the papers at the moment because. Uh, there's uh, not a day goes by without somebody on the verge of bankruptcy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we commissioned this specifically because we wanted to have um, more insights as to what was driving our customers from a broad point of view um, around different areas of the risk spectrum. Um, it, it's in interesting primarily because um, operational risk is an area of banking that has not received as much attention as you would say credit risk or market risk, for example. Um, and uh, operational risk is the bulk of the risk that transaction banks run. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it, it becomes naturally an area of specialization that we should adopt as our own as part of our competencies around what we can offer to our clients. Um, so interesting foreign exchange risk came up as one of the key risks, which is not new. Um, any customer that operates across borders and across currency zones yeah. sees that as a risk. Um, I think in Europe in particular, we'd seen the arrival of the euro, and we, we probably thought that um, currency risk was therefore becoming less relevant to some people. I think this reminds us that for any client operating across borders, currency risk is a, is a, is a primary it's, it's concern. Very much currency fluctuation, yes. right? Yeah. Whereas if you took another one of these risk buckets, cybercrime, of course, nobody had heard of cybercrime three or four years ago. So this yeah. is not like foreign exchange. This is something relatively new. Um, it's primarily associated with the internet. That's how people think of cybercrime. 
and, and certainly from air experience, most of the um, uh, uh, routes into damaging air infrastructure comes in through the internet in some shape or form. Karen, what's, uh, I mean, if you've done a survey like that of your customers, but, but if, if you had done or if you were going to, would you expect to get the same sort of replies? Some of the issues that we haven't mentioned, and, and Didier suggested that it's all going to be down to price in future. I think mm -hmm. what we're finding is that the clients are actually very concerned about how they link in very solid relationships. The financial crisis really showed them that the relationships with their banks um, and the relationship with their buyers and suppliers is incredibly important to them. Sentinel, is that, is that your uh, experience that you're hearing from, from people in the market? Yeah, there, there are, there's one distinguishing trait of a transaction leader or somebody who is kind of the champion in the market, especially on the issue of uh, security and uh, building that trust. I think the, the investment made by banks in uh, interacting with the clients on a portal, bringing all the parts of the bank to the transaction portal has helped a lot. Mm -hmm. So th that is one way to really secure. But uh, the, the, there is also the open issues about how the client accesses it. The second idea which I probably picked it up many years back when we were called in to uh, find out whether we can help RBS do one of these. I don't know if you recall, there was a, a system called the client money systems, where there, it was primarily a retail or a wealth kind of a business, but it, there was somebody who was managing, uh, a specialist who was managing clients. But that could be a very effective way of overlooking the supply chain with the leader. So you go sign up with one of the uh, brands and then you get all the underlying uh, suppliers in the brand and then you can use the on-account trading model uh, which is now all technology enabled so that it completely automates the process. Karen, you were, you were, you were nodding through, throughout that statement. <laughs> is it because you agree that is possible or is that actually what you're able to deliver? Or <laughs> It is definitely moving in that yeah. direction. I, th I think we're finding clients um, when you have a, a very good either web-based portal or host-to-host -host linkages, which we're working a lot on, um, the, cl the clients, this, the service level to the clients goes up enormously. Um, not only are they able to control a lot of, more of the transaction themselves, but the quality of the operations goes up because it can stay electronic throughout the process. Um, I think where the industry is still has some work to do is you want multi-bank solutions. Mm -hmm. So whether that's through SWIFT or other entities, we've mm -hmm. had Bolero, we've had other things around. On, on the trade and supply t chain space, we haven't quite got there yet in the multi-bank solutions. Also, I think under the new opportunities heading, I think it's quite interesting we talk about trade because mm. trade is in somehow sort of cast in a different century. Mm. We've still got bills of lading, letters of credit, <laughs> yeah, all of yeah, these sorts yeah, of things, bits yeah, of yeah. paper that float around the global economy where most of the world has moved on to an electronic settlement system in, in many ways. But trade is yeah. still stuck in the dark ages. Um, and it's clearly ripe for new opportunities for trade to be modernised. There have been a few attempts in the past, they've, you yeah. know, they've floundered for various reasons, and it does require quite a lot of parties to come together to make trade effective. Okay, all right. Mark, you wanted to add something there. No, I was just going to say that I think one of the issues that the banks have uh, are in a quandary about is the, the level of technology investment that's happened over the years. So with all the regulation that's been demanded now, and certainly in the UK more than ever, with you know the the commission on banking talking about openness and so on so there's lots of local domestic issues notwithstanding the mm -hmm. the broader global uh, significance but the thing that I, I coming from a technology background I've often found with banks particularly they tend to add another silo add another silo not look at the core technology in order to create something that's much more flexible and so when these new regulations appear when new opportunities present themselves, they're architecturally inhibited. 